हेलो Hi all, uh, welcome you to the next uh, session of Android Software Testing. Uh, this is on the Unit 2 Testing Methods. Uh, today we study about uh, equivalence partition. In the last session uh, we had gone through different uh, types of testing. Just to do a recap of uh, what are the testing methods uh, that we have done. Uh, last session uh, we went through a recap of uh, the unit 1 sessions, all the 11 sessions we had gone through and uh, also we defined about IV and V which is about uh, validation and verification. And uh, we studied about uh, dynamic testing, uh, we had defined uh, several definitions of dynamic testing like it is very important to understand. Uh, it is a process of evaluating the system when the system is uh, executing. That means we do the testing when we execute the program. The other method uh, compared to dynamic testing is the static testing. This will be done uh, without the need of executing the evidence of the system. So, this will okay. So, we studied about uh, dynamic testing. Uh, uh, with a couple of definitions, also uh, we know the other method of testing uh, using the static testing, which doesn't need uh, the program to execute. So this could be the software analysis, uh, walkthrough, inspections, etc. Also, we had gone through two types of dynamic testing at a broader level, explicit uh, dynamic testing where uh, most of the system functions are tested by so specifically designed for that purpose. Implicit dynamic testing we do the uh, testing based on uh, what we have done using explicit, explicit dynamic testing that is uh, the process that we had done for dynamic testing uh, will help us uh, in Understanding or uh, analyzing some more test cases uh, that is all directly or implicitly tested. And uh, structured basis, basis testing uh, for dynamic testing, uh, we had already gone through in the unit one that is the PM method, uh, which has a little principles. So, similar approaches are uh, with the test processes, uh, which we have uh, defined in the beginning of the. Uh, sessions the unit one. Uh, then uh, we also studied that uh, both are required because uh, dynamic testing alone uh, may not be sufficient to completely test the embedded system. The static uh, means of testing also is uh, important. So both of these techniques uh, complement each other. Static analysis was explicitly used in all the days uh, because uh, those days we didn't have. Uh, much tools or the tools were very expensive, so that is why we used to do static analysis more compared to dynamic testing. Nowadays, dynamic testing is more uh, majorly that is being used and automated a lot. Wherever it is not possible, or when where we need to complement with uh, sufficient uh, coverage and all that, so there we will do the uh, static testing. Also, we know that uh, the different techniques are all based on two basic groups black box uh, testing and white box testing and uh, black box testing uh, testing techniques white box uh, testing techniques so we, we are going through currently so three broader things that we need to 
understand and define its techniques, strategy, test case selection methods, coverage criteria. So we detailed about the uh, test case selection methods. Uh, we know that uh, black box uh, testing is basically driven from uh, the data or the functionality. In the white box, we study in detail uh, the implementation or the logic underneath the embedded software. Uh, this is the depiction of uh, black box and white box. You can see at the upper top a black box uh, covering the functionality, white box uh, for the component testing. So in between certain embedded systems, so they fall a gray box. It's a mix of both white box as well as black box. And uh, coming to the coverage, we had uh, seen the formula how they do the code coverage, uh, total code and executed code. Both of them are used in uh, coming up how much of the percentage we have covered. So it is simple executed code divided by total code in terms of percentage gives the code coverage. This is for the white box venue. Uh, Similarly, for uh, black box, uh, we measure the coverage in terms of requirements. The total number of requirements uh, that we tested against the total number of requirements that will give you the coverage in terms of percentage. And also, we had uh, outlined the difference between uh, differences between black box testing and white box testing. Also, we underwent uh, black box uh, testing advantages, black box uh, testing disadvantages, white box testing advantages, and white box testing disadvantages. So, these were uh, some of the testing uh, aspects that we have studied in the previous session. Now, moving to the today's session, uh, elaborating uh, different uh, black box uh, testing methods. So, we will uh, detail on uh, a test selection uh, technique called equivalence partitioning. What is equivalence partitioning? Okay, uh, to understand uh, what is equivalence partitioning, we need to have some background. We all know that uh, we do embed systems uh, testing with the help of the test cases. Uh, we have studied uh, the strategy, test planning, uh, defining the test cases, given a requirement or the uh, specification. So typically the universe of all possible test cases is so large. That means suppose uh, we, uh, we had uh, gone through an uh, example uh, requirement say 1 to 10. So we know that uh, that system can take from 1 to 10. Uh, we know that we can define the inputs in terms of one to ten. But in larger systems this may have from one to ten thousand or maybe even hundred thousand, whatever it is. So it is bound to happen such that it may become very large. So is it possible to test all these so we need to select only relatively small number of test cases because we know that it is going to work for one, it is going to work for two, three, ten and for some cases it may not work. So we need to understand what are the inputs that basically it takes. So we need to relate them in a small number of test cases, all test selection need not be required. So that is what the, the partitioning, the number of test cases whatever we have is called equivalence, equivalence classes. So the next comes the question which test cases we should choose or which test cases we should select. So for all of these we come across in a concept called equivalence partition. This will help uh, in doing the test case selection. Okay. Okay. So some more. Uh, uh, details. Uh, two test cases are uh, considered to be equivalent if we expect the program to process them in the same way. That means uh, we know for a system if we feed one or if we feed two, three, whatever it is, and we get the same result. 
and we don't need to repeat them. We call that as equivalent. Similarly, we group different different uh, equivalence uh, test cases, equivalent test cases. They all can be grouped. How they can be grouped? Uh, we will uh, study in the next session. That means. Identifying the sets of inputs under the assumption that all values in the set are treated exactly the same by the system of As I said, you feed all these values, the behavior is same, the output is same. That means we are able to test with these values. So, equivalence partition is the most fundamental test case techniques. So the irrespective of whatever the software testing you want to do, uh, this is a mandatory testing uh, technique that they adopt. Okay, so we identify the sets of inputs under the assumption that all values are treated and the behavior is same. The next one is make one test case for each identified set. That means we have identified the sets of inputs which behave same. Then out of that, you identify one test case. The partition of the input domain of a program such that a test of a representative value of the class is equivalent to test of other values of the class. Uh, it is telling in detail saying that the testing of one the class is equal to the other one. This technique involves designing of test cases for testing classes of errors instead of individual errors. That means this technique. Uh, Basically, identifies the design of most appropriate test case uh, for identifying the test classes, which will uh, result in uh, failures or errors uh, in a group uh, of the system under test than of individual errors. That means, if I feed uh, one, the system is behaving uh, in a faulty way, and they are feeding two. Feeding three, four different different way, we identify appropriate failures or errors as a group between one to ten. Suppose I am going to make, uh, I know that it's going to fail. Then the most appropriate one I am going to select. It. That's what it means. So in detail further, if one test case in an equivalence class detects an error, all other test cases in the equivalence class are detected the same error. That means the type of error that it finds is the same. Conversely, if one test case did not detect an error, all the other test cases are not expected to find any error. That means in that group, if you are not finding one test case, other test cases also expected to not find any error. So, other definition is that equivalence partitioning helps to reduce the number of test cases and ensure that software performs the way it is supposed to do for different kinds of input. So, as I said. Different uh, number of uh, inputs we can have to test it, but it's not realistic to have all those inputs, especially the larger systems where we have a number of inputs in terms of thousands of uh, values. So this equivalence partitioning will help in reducing that. So equivalence partitioning is one of the most uh, black box uh, testing technique. Uh, basically, the underlying idea is that the input domain can be divided into number of equivalence classes. The characteristics of an equivalence class is the assumption that all values belonging to that class are handled in exactly the same manner by the program. If the assumption is true, then it would suffice to select only one, one single test case for each equivalence class. Uh, because multiple test cases from the same equivalence class would repeat, right? So, test is unnecessarily repeated, the result we all know. So, coverage is uh, measured by dividing the number of uh, test cases. Uh, we know how much is uh, uh, done in terms of pass fail count. So, it is basically the number of tested uh, equivalence classes by the total number of equivalence classes. So the workflow when using a equivalence partitioning is to analyze the specification and try to identify all likely equivalence classes. First the thing we do is we analyze the specification.
we analyze the specification and try to identify all likely equivalence classes so when doing this uh, it's important to remember that there may be dependencies between different input variables that means we feed variables a b c etc there could be dependency between a and b b and c uh, etc so every possible input value belongs to exactly one equivalent class if that variation is there then we can divide further into different classes so the final next step is to check uh, choose a, a good representative out of all is equivalence classes to form the test case for that equivalence so that is the aim of the equivalence uh, partitioning uh, identification okay in elaboration of that we probably go through different examples you may understand better okay so uh, different views are there uh, uh, based on the reference that we have uh, the reference i had put it in the bottom uh, so to have a clear understanding uh, basically equivalence partition theory as proposed by Montford Mayer attempts to reduce the total number of test cases necessary by partitioning the input conditions into a finite number of equivalence classes this we know we analyze the specification and come up with the equivalence classes so this will reduce the number of test cases total number of test cases ability to guide the tester using sample strategy to reduce the combinational or combinatorial explosion of potentially necessary tests that means uh, as part of the strategy the next thing is we do a sampling that means there are 100 possible way to find a uh, good test case or find a error so what we do is we do a sampling like 10% 20% of that which is enough to bring the errors or the failures of the particular system so that will be done with the help of this equivalence partitioning that's what it means okay yeah, continuation of the equivalence partition description it's the principle of deriving the test cases the input domain all possible input values is partitioned into equivalence class for all input values in a particular equivalence class the system shows the same kind of behavior that means the processing is same that means the output that is expected of that or uh, the functionality that is getting executed out of both set of uh, equivalence class inputs are same the idea behind this principle is that all inputs from the same equivalence class have an equal chance of finding a defect and that testing with more inputs from the same class hardly increases the chance of finding a defect that means we already found a defect it won't increase any more defects in terms of finding a different defect instead of testing every possible input value it is sufficient to choose one input from each equivalence class this greatly reduces the number of test cases while still achieving a good coverage so what we understand from the equivalence partition is that uh, we divide the entire uh, bunch of uh, test cases based on the behavior that the inputs that we provide will result in the failure or passes so we divide all of them uh, as a chosen uh, equivalent class okay so the equivalence partitioning is basically on uh, it is called a two level of two partitioning uh, one is called valid other one is called invalid test cases that means the one that are going to be tested with the help of the you can say normal range or the expected way of uh, usual behavior of the system that is called
वेल टेस्ट क्लास और वेल डिफेंस क्लास विजुअल बिहेवियर व्हाट इज एक्सपेक्टेड फ्रॉम दी सिस्टम एंड टेस्ट ऑल दिस कम्स अंडर वेल क्लास द वन दैट इज not so usual or or what is not expected when the system is running normally uh i would say each of these behavior it is other behavior than what is normally done Uh, when the system is executing normally, so this uh, can be classified as invalid test cases. So two groups of valid and invalid test cases are there. They are all coming under equivalence partition. As a result of equivalence partitioning, we are going to have two types of uh, partitioning: valid and invalid. So probably, okay. So uh, let us see equivalence partition forms. Uh, uh, what are the types that we have for equal space so there are two basic uh, methods or two basic uh, partitioning that we have for equal space that is why it is called as partitioning one is valid partitioning other one is invalid partitioning so what is valid partition when we have the system running normally that means executing normally or deployed in the field working as expected so that is that will result in normal behavior or usual behavior those are all coming under valid uh, test cases the inputs that with the help of those test cases will result in usual behavior or the normal uh, range suppose 1 to 10 is what the system is expected to give or 1 to 10 is what ex- the system is expected to take input and give us a proper result will come under all valid uh, equivalence the other way of uh, testing is with the help of like negative values or the outside the boundary so which will result in some sort of a uh, uh, what is it called uh, other behavior of the normal uh, uh, system so those are all coming under invalid test cases so basically what we have to try trying to say is uh we may have uh, uh see this left side you can see a number of uh, valid uh, test cases these dots blank dots are all uh, valid test cases maybe we can group them uh, something like uh, one group is uh, for this group group could be for this one more group can comprising uh, these three this uh i'll repeat so we have this rectangle box identifying all the test cases that's what we do right so in that we are going to have two partitions valid and invalid so in valid what we do so all the valid inputs which will behave in the same output we are going to define one equivalent class this one equivalent class the first one next could be this one the next could be this one so it has three test cases so we have four equivalent valid equivalent class similarly for invalid also we are going to have something similar to this something similar to this we are having four invalid test cases we are having more actually but what we do we see the behavior is same. that is why the equivalence uh, coming to picture then equivalence has two things one is uh, valid and the other is invalid so these are uh, the primary first level of partitioning we do okay uh we have the detail uh, the same uh, diagram what we have seen in the previous slide here what we have is we define or we name each of them with some numbers like equivalence 1 equivalence 2 equivalence 
etc so further maybe you can uh, change it as something like equivalence valid 1 equivalence valid 2 equivalence valid 3 similarly equivalence invalid 5 equivalence invalid 6 so we have three valid classes and three invalid classes uh, as i said in the previous slide we again we can group each of this since we don't have to repeat all the test cases which are resulting in the same behavior so we have three right so we have to cover this the third one could be this so we have valid three test cases similarly we have invalid three cases this space whatever we see all these rest of them can be other one so three valid and three invalid it again depends on what sort of test cases for the behavior of the system right so first step is to identify all the test cases then divide the sphere into two two level of partition so one is valid other one is invalid so then we group valid such way that the behavior is usual and uh, the similar results are going to come all of these are grouped so there are four here in this case three so we name that as equivalence uh, valid 1 equivalence valid 2 equivalence valid 3 similarly we can name it invalid cases also with a unique identifier so that's what is highlighted here partition valid one is three equivalence classes create a test case for at least one value from each equivalence class that is we have two three probably let us select an appropriate one which is good enough to have a repository for that particular valid or invalid class so partition valid and invalid test case for the equivalence class first then create a test case for at least one value from each equivalence class that's what it means okay let us take an example with that help of uh, uh, with the help of that probably we are uh, more clear okay this uh, rectangular box identifies three columns the first one is being an input suppose you take this as an input that means this is a requirement let's say two are there the integer n such that the n takes from minus 99 to plus 99 so that is what the input it goes for a requirement so what are the valid equivalence classes that we can arrive at and what are the invalid equivalence classes that we can arrive at for this particular input set similarly one more uh, let's identify this is being a phone number phone number will have area code which is 200 999 and there is a prefix of 200 999 suffix any four digits any four digits can be there as a prefix this is under the set of uh, test case uh, input and uh, what are the valid equivalence classes for this and uh, what are the invalid equivalence classes for this any guess okay the first one will take we know that the n takes from minus 1 to 99 that means the system is expected to take the input from minus 99 to plus 99 so we can have number of test cases minus 99 minus 98 minus 97 etc minus 99 Minus ninety eight, minus ninety seven, but all are 
within the range then we can have 0 1 2 maybe 10 20 30 50 60 90 99 right so these are all it can take that's what uh, the input that we have but do we need to have all this we know that these are all valid because this first thing is these are all valid okay so valid equivalence class because still it is not equivalence class it is just a valid input value that that n can take minus 98 can take minus 98 it can take 97 etc up to plus 99 so these are all test cases but we do not need to have all this probably we can group uh, this again based on the system what is going to be tested it is subjective it could be a analog or, or it could be some system having a sensor or input taking uh, different values so that we need to understand that system and uh, from the system perspective then probably to said that is the best way but in general we can choose a group of test cases in such a way that it makes sense here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 so that all need not have to be tested so this will become an equivalence class this will also become a valid equivalence class because we have already had all the valid values so here about 5 are there minus 9 to 9 minus 10 so two negative side we want to have with a two digit number and some more we want to fit because the implementation could have some issues in terms of single digit so that way we can divide it second second equivalent term class having minus 9 minus 1 where a single digit negative number it is taking then there is a value of 0 so 0 also should accept as per this input range then similarly we have 1 to 9 1 and 9 on the single digit side and we have 10 and 9 to 9 so this is the maximum value so this is a good example of a value class. Okay, the next one invalid equivalence class. So what could be the invalid equivalence class? We know that the valid equivalence class we have defined from minus nine to plus nine to the one which is invalid for n is nothing but invalid test cases. But this invalid test cases can be anything. It can be minus 98, minus 47, sorry, it could be minus 100, minus 101, 102, etc. So it can grow, but better to identify few of them. Similarly, the plus side we have a 99, it can take 100, 102, 110, 200. Some randomly we need to do it. Those are all will become a Sensible equivalence class test cases, but under the category of invalid. Why? Because as a normal case, it is not expected to take that. So this will become an invalid test case. That means the system is supposed to throw an error, or system is supposed to behave not usual manner. That is why it is called as invalid test case. So what are the few example invalid equivalence classes? For this range, minus 99 less than minus 99, we can specify the value such as minus 100. Then other one is greater than 99, such as plus 100. Then uh, the numbers are uh, malformed, or the numbers are uh, uh, tweaked in such a way that uh, the system. Uh, will accept as a negative or unusual value like 12 minus instead of minus 12 we are giving 12 minus similarly we are giving the input as 1 minus 2 minus 3 so this you consider something like a value instead of a number basically so the system has an n and it which accepts the input in terms of minus 99 to plus 99 and the input that we are trying to provide is 12 minus similarly 1 minus 2 minus 3 likewise we can add anything that we want 
in terms of numbers. The numbers are wrongly fed. Similarly, non-numeric strings. That means, instead of number, we are trying to give a some character which you should not expect. Something like numeric alpha, numeric here, some special characters. So maybe you would have seen this uh, while testing the. Uh, Software, uh, you have all you have seen uh, password, right? So password it is supposed to expect a defined input only. It cannot change. So that is a good example of uh, providing a input. The input is supposed to be the same manner what is being specified in requirement. The empty value. That means this is a blank. Sometimes the blank is uh, specified as it's up to the specific program. So these are two valid and invalid uh, equivalence classes. Example. Similarly, for phone number, valid equivalence class. We know that area code two hundred two ninety nine. So we can have five 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 to five 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 five. Then uh, five 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 with a five 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 as a prefix. Then we have five 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 six five 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 five. This is uh, another valid phone number. Then we have two hundred. Let's say equal to area code. Let's say equal to ninety nine. That means prefix. We are having. Uh, Identified a two hundred to nine eighty nine. Similarly, the last one being prefix itself identified as two hundred to ninety nine. So it is similar to what is been uh, uh, there for the n. Here we have a phone number with this range specified. So what are the invalid equivalence classes? So invalid format is five 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 together. So similarly, the next one, two prefixes are there. Supposed to be one by one prefix. Area code less than two hundred. So maybe hundred or minus value. Similarly, it could be greater than nine ninety nine. Then the other invalid class. So. This one itself is an invalid. The format itself is what we call class. So in that, so this is the entire group itself is one invalid class. This is one invalid. So we have similarly four invalid classes, which are sufficient to test it. So area code with non-numeric characters such as gen characters or blank spaces, all this can be invalid equivalence class. So this is an example of. We'll study more examples in the next slide. Okay. Now having seen this example and definitions, we will again revisit our uh, equivalence class understanding. Two types of equivalence classes are classified: valid equivalence class, set of valid inputs to the program. All other inputs which are not included under in valid classes are called invalid equivalence classes. Okay. Few guidelines for identifying the equivalence classes. The first one: if an input condition specifies a range of value, suppose one to hundred, the equivalence classes are. One valid equivalence class counted from one to hundred. Two invalid equivalence class. One is less than the first count, and the other one greater than the the last count. Okay. The next guidelines. So this is a different different sort of uh, techniques. That is what is this guidelines talks about. The second one is about uh, If an input specifies a set of values which are handled differently, like type of color, that means red, blue, green is an input, a set of input. Then the equivalence classes. What are the equivalence classes? 
so we have one valid equivalence class also for each value that means red and then we have blue then we have green this is one uh, valid equivalence class one more uh, invalid equivalence class we can call out of this like maybe it could be white or yellow it could be the other set of example third one third guideline if an input condition specifies a must be value the character must be a letter suppose the equivalence classes are here basically depending on depends on the type of oh, the impending requirement like the requirement talks about the count here so count will have oh, in terms of number less than greater than count here uh, this is a character so we need to feed with a uh, invalid character or the invalid group of character red blue green is a valid group as one is a invalid uh, equivalence class Similarly, we have a must be a value sort of input condition is available. Then, what are what is the valid equivalence class talks about is any letter we should consider. The any letter it has is nothing but a valid equivalence class. Other than any letter, or it is called a non-letter. It could be number or special character. That is nothing but invalid equivalence class. So all these are. Scattered here in this example, we can see where we have uh, taken only the numbers as an input, and uh, what are the non-numbers? What are the misinterpreted numbers? All these are part of the invalid equivalence class, and valid numbers and all in the range are called valid equivalence class. The fourth guideline: everything finished long before the task is done is an equivalence class. everything done within some short time interval before the program is finished is another class everything done just before program starts another operation is another class that means we have a time based requirements suppose in those cases how we can define uh, the equivalence class is what we are talking about so everything finished long before the task is done is a valid equivalence class everything done within some short time interval before the program is finished is another way. valid class we can say everything is done just before program starts another operation is another class. that means three equivalence classes have been defined for the time or length of the requirement that is one guideline that is the fourth guide fifth one this talks about a memory if a program is specified to work with memory size suppose the memory can take from 64 mb to 256 mb so What is it going to take for equivalence? Then the size range is an equivalence class because we know the size. What is the lower size? What is the higher size? Any other memory size which is greater than 256, or any other size which is less than 64, this can be accepted. It should accept, and those are all called invalid equivalence class. Likewise, we can define the equivalence partition for this sort of a requirement. the last uh, sort of guideline is the partition of output event lies in the inputs of the program this is very important so it is not just the input based equivalence partitioning there are output based partitioning also that is possible due to the certain set of inputs the outputs can be derived so based on the outputs also we need to Define that is what it means. Even though different input equivalence classes could be could have same type of output event, you should still treat the input equivalence classes distinctly. What it means is we have two equivalence classes, but still it will result in same output. But based type of based on type of equivalence classes, we need to categorize it. So for example, it may throw an error. For all this, as a one error, but that means we have one output. But still, we want to test it because we know what input it can take. So that's what it means. So output event uh, based on that. So one example we'll take here: if an analog variable where need to operate within the range 1.0 to 6.0, so it's a analog input which can take or which will operate 
with a range of 1.0 to 6.0. So, what are the equivalence classes that can be performed? The first type of equivalence class input value was variable equal to 0.9, that is less than 1.0. Another input value for variable equal to 4.0. This is normal range because 4.0 is greater than 1 and less than 6. Wrongly put here, it is uh, this way. So, 4.0 is uh, greater than 1.0 and less than 6.0. So, that way we can uh, have the second set of uh, equivalence. The third one will be input value for variable equal to 6.1, which is just outside the range, which is also an invalid class. So, with the help of these guidelines, we are going to define different types of valid and invalid partitioning classes. Okay, one more example. The system behavior is subjected to the following condition regarding to the input temperature. Suppose temperature lies within 15 to 40. Here it is very important it is equal to is there. So it is including 15 and it is including the 40 at the outer boundary. So sometimes uh, we have to be careful in uh, doing the test case selection because the requirement says less than. Uh, those are all trivial, but it is not a good practice to have a requirement specifying less than. So what will happen with equal to? So testers should not get confused. So, better to mention as less than or equal to similarly as a outer boundary as greater than or equal to or less than or equal to whatever the way uh, the equal to or greater than uh, less than operators are used. The number of possible values for the temperature is huge. This we can have 15.01, 15.02, 15.1, 15.2, 15 15.3 likewise. Till 39.9999, subject to the acceptability of the embedded system. So, it is uh, infinite, the value could be different. We know that we are going to have an equivalence partition for the sake of reducing all this. So, that is what we mentioned here. Three equivalence classes can be defined for this. Temperature is lower than 15, lower than or equal to 15. Temperature has a value, sorry, uh, temperature is lower than 15 because equal to is also a valid class. Temperature the value is the range of 15 to 40. Temperature is higher than 40. So three type three equivalence classes can be defined. So three test cases are sufficient to cover the equivalence classes. We don't have to have a division because it is enough to test the condition. So invalid two are there 10 and 50. Sorry, 10 and 50. Valid we have one. It could be anything between 15 to 40. That is 35. For example, the choice of that particular value depending on the what exactly we are trying to test it. If the temperature of this sort of a requirement, we need to have 35. If you think that the system could fail at 35.5 or say uh, 39.5, you can have it. We will study about that uh, uh, boundary value analysis uh, in the next slides. Because that will complement further equivalence partitioning. So that is also an important technique. And we'll study about boundary value analysis maybe in class. Okay, equivalence partitioning continued. One more good example uh, I will depict here. Uh, let us consider the fuel level. So uh, we shall set an indicator as per the below conditions. So fuel level uh, identifies the, the levels of the fuel. Based on the level, it will indicate. So that's what the requirements. There are three requirements underneath this. If the level goes below 10 liters, it shall set the indicator to yellow. If the level goes above 100 liters or below 1 liters, it shall set the indicator to red. Otherwise, it shall set the indicator to green. So, what it means? Here is that from 10 to 
100 liters we have the indicator set as green and the above 100 or above sorry below 1 liter it shall set as red the one below 10 and above 1 it will set as yellow so just to have an understanding of different values I will just repeat so there are three sub requirements for fuel oil filter uh, the one requirement for green which talks about 10 to 100 liters the one talks about red which is less than 1 liter or above 100 liters the indicator will show red the one that is showing between 1 and 10 will indicate as yellow. So what are valid and what are invalid with the help of this below one we can identify uh, invalid 0 and 1 the value which is in between or invalid which is in red the value between 9 and 10 are valid but it is an yellow indicator because the requirement talks about yellow so it is a value the next one the value between 100 or the only less than that is green because the requirement tells that between 10 and 100 should be green and between 1 and 10 should be yellow and before 1 it is invalid. Similarly the last one is we have to set the indicator as a red if an invalid input is there invalid input could be greater than 100 which is 100 more 2 10 etc. So that is what is depicted with the help of this example. So this is a table. Uh, this is good to have this sort of a truth table. It is called the truth table. Why? Because it uh, identifies all the combinations of input and uh, which is good enough to identify and differentiate between invalid and valid classes. So what we see here a two table identifying on the left hand side you can see a red yellow green as the indicator and right hand side you see a different sort of class. So what are those classes we have? We have class A, class B, class C, class C identifying for different indicators. Less than one we have an indicator which is set in the truth table as ticked. Similarly we have a yellow indicated Less than 10, maybe we can add another one as greater than one also. Uh, it is up to you how you want to define the truth table. Similarly, we have an indicator greater than 10 coming under as uh, green. Similarly, we have greater than 100 coming under red. We can also add less than 100, greater than 10, some more. Uh, we can take it up as a x So out of all these, what are the valid equivalences? What are the invalid equivalences? So we have four about groups here. So invalid is zero and minus one because the requirement doesn't talk about that. Zero and one minus one. So that is why it is invalid. Similarly, the other extreme of the requirement is hundred and one at one two. That is also an invalid equivalence partition. So we have two valid one valid two equivalence partitioning. One two three four up to nine. 
10, 11, 12, 13, up to 100. So, in this valid equivalence class, we can choose something like 1, 5, and 9, or it could be just 1 is enough. Similarly, for the valid second group of equivalence class, we can have 10, 20, 100, likewise. So, as I said, output equivalence also can be done. This equivalence partitioning can be done with the help of output domain, that means output based testing where the outputs can vary for different inputs and the single inputs also there are output based testing which we need to consider for the equivalence partition. Test cases are then derived to cover all equivalence output classes that means we derive all the test cases which will take care of the output classes also. So, we will similarly we will define like the truth table we have for input for the output also. So, with that we come to the end of equivalence partitioning. So, we have gone through some of the equivalence classes examples, we defined the valid and invalid equivalence classes and the guidelines such as count, characters, uh, must be value and uh, size, time because majority of all the requirements will come up, come under this guidelines. Also, we went through a few good examples right at the way teaser. Then uh, we had defined uh, two partitions valid and invalid. We are going to identify and differentiate all these uh, test cases under this uh, partition. And uh, We identified a couple of good examples for equivalence partition. We also know that output based of partition we can do it. So, end of the class, as we do, so we have added more words. Did I miss any embedded software testing words? Let me see if I have missed anything. We can list it out. Okay, I think uh, we have everything. So, in addition to what we had, like IV and V, robustness, coolant classes, we have today valid and dynamic classes. Of course, boundary analysis, uh, boundary value analysis, we do in the next class. And uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, exercises, exercise questions. What are the main test selection criteria for black box system? So we have a three. Uh, rate equivalence classes for the so below the requirement. When the sensor temperature reaches less than 10 degrees centigrade or less than 100 degrees centigrade, it sets the value alert. Else, it sets the value normal. So we have a temperature sensor which will indicate as an alert if the temperature goes below 10 degree or goes above 100 degree. Otherwise, it sets the value, it sets the indicator as normal. Write the boundary class values for the above with tolerance of plus or minus 1 degree centigrade. Anyway, boundary class values for the next session. So, that is the end of the session.